Okay, well, welcome everybody. If you can grab your seats, we're going to get started here. Um, this uh, panel is called uh, uh, The Law That uh, Transformed Sports and the World. Um, you know, last week, Title IX commemorated its 50th anniversary. Uh, it's been a half century since the landmark law was enacted, prohibiting schools from, uh, that receive federal funds from discriminating by gender in the provision of educational programs or activities. Those activities include uh, sports. And no doubt in recent days you've been reading the media reports, uh, the reflections on this, uh, and the extraordinary impact of the law. Some numbers for you. The, uh, the number of girls playing high school sports grew from 294,000 in 1972 to 3.4 million today. Fewer than 30,000 women competed in college before Title IX. Today, it's more than 219,000. U.S. women now win more medals, I don't know if you know this, more medals in the Olympics than the men do. <laughs> and that has created the foundation for the introduction and the growth of women's sports leagues for women in basketball, soccer, volleyball, and other sports. All in all, as someone who has studied this space, who knows sports policy and the history of sports in this country, um, I think it's fair to say that Title IX has been the most important development uh, in organized sports since the introduction of organized sports at the start of the 20th century by a coalition of child savers and military recruiters and uh, you know, uh, uh, medical doctors and other folks who really put sports at the center of the American idea at the turn of the century. And that's because more than, it's been more significant than, uh, than the, you know, Babe Ruth and the advent of sports television and Friday Night Lights uh, and any number of other phenomena because Title IX challenged the long-standing notion that sports belong to men. It opened up uh, this type of activity to the other part, uh, you know, other half of the population. But tonight I'd like to go beyond that. Uh, that conversation, explore a couple of largely unchartered impacts uh, from Title IX. It's the impact on business and the impact globally. And I also like to talk about some of the uh, uh, gaps that remain and the unintended consequences of Title IX. And maybe we'll even get into how uh, ro the, the lifting of Roe v. Wade impacts Title IX opportunities moving forward. And we have two of the very best guests to help us uh, uh, have that conversation. Eileen Gu on my left here is the youngest Olympic freestyle gold medalist in history, taking home two golds. <laughs> and one silver. She is uh, the only extreme sport athlete to win three medals in the same Olympics. X Games right here in Aspen was her first FIS World Championships. Uh, Eileen is one of Time, one, uh, Time Magazine's 100 most influential people of 2022 and is Forbes Asia, Forbes Asia 30 under 30 and 21 and 22. Through her efforts to promote multicultural communication, inspire youth, and advocate for women through sport, Eileen is an ambassador for the Salt Lake City 2030 Olympic bid. Uh, the youngest and only female global ambassador for the Asia Society Southern California, and the 2022 Apex for Youth Next Generation Award recipient. You can go on and on about her. She's also uh, an accomplished runway model. She's been on the covers of Vogue and Elle and Harper's Bazaar and, and more. She had a near perfect GPA and SAT score and will attend Stanford University in the fall. And if you really want to learn about cryptocurrency, ask her about no. that too. She, <laughs> we just had a great conversation with her. So unbelievable. I'm so impressed with Eileen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Sheila Johnson is uh, founder and CEO of Salamander Hotels and Resorts, a collection of luxury properties in the US and Caribbean. And she also manages, her company manages the Aspen Meadows Resort, where the Ideas Festival is mostly being held. As vice chairman of Monumental Sports and Entertainment in DC, she is the only African American woman to have ownership in three professional sports teams the NBA's Washington Wizards, the NHL's Washington Capitals, and the WNBA's 
uh, Washington Mystics. She is the co-founder of Black Entertainment Television and has executive produced uh, documentaries and feature films, including, didn't you, weren't you involved with Summer of Soul? Yeah, Warner Brothers. Oh! Yeah. 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 I saw it on, and a Grammy. I saw that on the plane coming back from Italy last week. It was amazing. It's just an incredible historical account. I mean, there's, um, you know, there is uh, um, Woodstock, which we've all talked about quite a bit, but this Harlem uh, music festival that right. nobody really has spent any time documenting, she and her team did an amazing job. So I highly recommend it. She, uh, Sheila serves on the boards of multiple arts and education organizations, including the Metropolitan Opera and the Jackie Robinson Foundation. Y'all have accomplished way too much, okay? <laughs> that took a lot, but I had to get it out. It's women. You know? <laughs> we do. All right, so we're gonna have a great conversation. I want to start with you, Sheila. Okay. okay we're gonna do the before and the after. Oh yeah, I'm I'm really the before. Yeah. Can they fix this? this? The sound of this is too much. Is the audio? Yes, the audio. That's not good. Okay. All right. So you grew up in the night in the 1960s. Uh, uh, title line was 1970s. Uh, uh, yeah, I grew up way before that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were in high school in the 1960s, right? All right, we'll, we'll put it in this context. I graduated from the University of Illinois in 1970. I was a cheerleader, the University of Illinois cheerleader. So this was all before Title IX because I couldn't do anything else, okay? I couldn't run track. I couldn't p participate in team sports. So in 1972, <laughs> um, was the beginning of Title, title IX, which yep. is really transforming. <coughs> but I just want you all to know, and I do remember when it was passed, I had fathers come up to me irate about you are taking money away from my, my son. You are, I mean, it just went on and on and on. And you know, I couldn't even discuss it openly. There was a lot of anger about Title IX. Yeah. And that's something that we should never forget. And um, I think about that all the time. <coughs> yeah. So paint a picture for me in the 1960s. What type of opportunities were available to you at that time? What sports uh, were offered at your school? What, well, I mean, how did in, girls in approach the, sports? Yeah, in the state of Illinois, we had PE every day. I mean, so we you know, did whatever you do in PE class. Yeah. Um, and even down at the University of Illinois, I, I, it was a requirement to take physical education, but there was no competition. The only competition was the trial for the cheerleading squad. And I'll tell you a funny little story about that. Um, I made the cheerleading squad, and I was in the music school of music, and I got thrown out of the school of music mm. because I made the cheerleading squad, and I had to campaign to get back into the school of music. Mm. So that's what happens, yeah. Mm. Now, Eileen, you're a little bit younger than Sheila. You came along. At a d <laughs> Eileen just turned 18? I'm 18, yeah. Yes. So the, by the time you were born, Title IX was uh, not only in place, it was being enforced, not perfectly, but it was being enforced. It was part of the language, the expectations of how girls are going to grow up in this country. Um, and I know it was a motivating force for you because there's video of you talking about this in middle school. Why don't you set this up? Absolutely, so I went to a all girls K through eight school. Our mission statement was to educate, encourage, and empower girls. And I learned so much from that school. And in seventh grade, I gave a speech about the importance of Title IX. And I grew up skiing. Uh, I started when I was eight in free skiing and I was the only girl on my team. And so it was this really interesting concept where I knew that Technically, from a legal standpoint, more girls could be doing it, but from a cultural standpoint, they weren't. And so I wanted to investigate a little bit more about that, but the first step really was to understand kind of the background about that. So keep in mind, I'm 11 years old in this, um, so I, my voice is super high, and it's really funny because, you know, I've been talking about this for six years now, um, six, seven years now, and from the beginning, I'm like, Title IX is really important. Here, I'm Eileen, and I really like to ski. And now it's like, I'm Eileen, I really like to ski, and Title IX is really important. But you know, 
<laughs> the message is still here. So it's, it's really cool looking back, and I'm really excited about our conversation today. I think we have a lot of really great insights and perspective between the two of us. So yeah, let's get That'll into it. It'll be perfect, it. yeah. Can we play the video, please? In our world today, men are significantly more likely to participate or find careers in sports than women. Many people claimed that this was just because men's muscles were naturally larger and stronger than that of the women's. So over time, stereotypes developed to negatively define female athletes. Females were often denied athletic opportunities because of their gender. The Title IX revolution helped to set things straight. Title IX is a portion of the United States Education Amendments of 1972. <coughs> this statute's purpose was to help protect against sex discrimination in both education and athletics. Even though Title IX has been on the books for 43 years and tons of progress has been made, sexism still exists. How many of you play basketball or soccer? The minimum play pay for a WNBA player in the 2015 season was $38,813. The minimum pay for an NBA player was $525,093. That means that the minimum pay for men's basketball was over 13 times more than that of the women's. If you all remember Peyton's speech, you might know that for winning the 2015 Soccer Women's World Cup, the USA women's team took home $2 million. In 2014, the US men's team, finishing in 11th place, took home $9 million. Even though the men's team placed conspicuously lower, the income was still over four times more. The highest paid female athlete in the world is tennis player Maria Sharapova, who has held this title for nine straight years. Her income for endorsements, sponsorships, and prize money is a hefty $29 million. That's a lot of money, right? Well, yes until you take a look at the world's highest paid male athlete, Tiger Woods. The golfer's income was an astounding $78 million. Doesn't seem too fair, now does it? Title IX and the Equal Pay Act have now both been passed. So what's the holdup? Traditionally and stereotypically, women are highly feminine, stay at home, and mothering figures. The words athletic or independent don't show up on that list. People are not accepting that women can be what they want to be yet, and they aren't accepting that women can make their own choices or pave their own paths. But if we accept it, we are just one step closer to equality. So when she talks about trying to make a difference in the lives of girls and women, uh, this has been a theme that has been in place for a while. You're just living out your your ideals. But tell me, at that time, why did Title IX mean so much to you? What was sort of the essence of it that caused you to, I mean, dedicate an entire speech to it? Well, I think that at that age, I was so acutely aware of what it meant to be the only girl there. And the feeling of looking around and just seeing nobody like me. And that feeling of like, but, but, we already have this law. Why, is, why are things not just, you know, we flip a switch and suddenly things are equal and things are perfect. And I think even at that time, you can see I was really grappling with this concept of, you know, there's the law and then there's like the cultural acceptance around it. And so especially being in an extreme sport and being in a sport where women are extremely not that, represent, not that well represented, um, it really struck a chord with me. So I wanted to talk I wanted to talk about it and I wanted to increase representation even then because I knew the power of what representation can do mm -hmm. and of what a cultural change can do. Sometimes, you know, policy influences culture, but sometimes culture also influences policy. Yeah. Um, and so that was something that I felt very passionate about and I still feel very passionate about. And so that's still my message to this day. I always have been saying I want to inspire young girls to get into sports, especially free skiing, to break their own boundaries in any way that they feel um, is beneficial to themselves, to use their voices, to make the world a better place, to be unapologetically themselves. And I've been talking about that for years and years and years. Actually, this morning I woke up to one of the most heartwarming things. Someone on Instagram um, had tagged me in a, in a post or in a story saying, thank you, Eileen, for introducing me to freestyle skiing. Thank you for changing my life. Mm -hmm. And 
it, you know, it almost brought a tear to my eye because it's, it's the fact that it, representation can do so much, so much more than, than what we think. And um, if you follow me on Instagram, it's actually on my Instagram story right now still. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I reposted it, but it was, yeah, that's, and, that's why I do it. And girls, not just here. I mean, China, which you represented in the Olympics, has a lot of people and a lot of girls that you've inspired over there. How much did that play a role in uh, the ability to have a global impact? Absolutely. I think sport culture is so uniquely positioned to encourage multicultural dialogue. I mean, if we talk about the ping pong diplomacy, if we talk about right now when we have the Olympics, bringing athletes from different countries, which in terms of policy or in terms of these big global geopolitical issues might not be in the place to be having those conversations that we should be having. Mm -hmm. And yet sport is this one avenue when people can truly come together and share this deeply human experience mm -hmm. of having a goal and then working towards it and struggling and maybe failing and learning resilience and then feeling that intense euphoria when you reach that goal. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is shared between all athletes, regardless of gender, regardless of age, regardless of sport, and regardless of nationality. Mm -hmm. And so that shared experience can be this root, I guess, foundation mm -hmm. on which we can build incredible amounts of dialogue, especially for young people. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's super empowering to me. Mm -hmm. What's been the high moment for you? Is there, was there an anecdote, some situation? I don't know where you're just like, wow, I've, I've had the impact that, uh, other than that post this morning. Um, wow, there have been tons, tons of moments after the Olympics that have just been incredibly mind blowing. I guess I'll, sh I'll tell a short story actually about the Olympics themselves. Yeah. So this whole time, you know, I've been saying I want girls to break their boundaries and to, to step out of their comfort zones and to show the world what women are capable of. Mm -hmm. And I remember at my last run at the Olympics, um, I was at in my big air contest. And for those who don't know, it's a three run final format. And so I had one more run. I was guaranteed a bronze medal. And I called my mom and I said, mom, I'm going to try a 1620, a double cork 1620. So um, that's four and a half rotations mm -hmm. for people who don't know. And uh, my mom is like, why would you do that? That's so dangerous. You have two more events after this, and you've never done that trick before. I've never done it on trampoline. I've never done it on airbag. I've never done it on snow. No you know, preparation beforehand. And I remember at the top, I literally told her, I said, Mom, the entire world is watching this sporting contest right now. They weren't, but in my head, they were. <laughs> uh, but you know, there were millions of people watching that broadcast. It's true. And so when I, I realized that it was this incredible opportunity to show people, even if I didn't land it, what kind of message that would send out about women in sports and women in free skiing and the progression and the pace and the willingness we have to try new things and to close that gap between men and women. Mm -hmm. And so even if I didn't land it, I knew people were gonna say, oh my God, did you see what Eileen tried? That's insane, you know, people. And so that is, so I told her that and she said, Eileen, why are you getting so philosophical right now? Like, <laughs> you drop in two minutes. Like, what? is this really what you're thinking about right now? And I said, yes, it is. You know, I've, I've said it my whole life and now I wanna um, practice what I preach. And so I did. And so that was one of the most impactful moments of my life. Yeah. Um, landing it and becoming the youngest Olympic yeah. priest. One of the things I enjoyed. Yeah. But that was why I did that. That yeah. was really the thought process behind it. And then also afterwards, just walking down the street, I remember um, a couple months later, I was in Beijing, just walking down the street. And I passed this group of girls. They looked very trendy, super well dressed. And we're just saying amongst each other, you know, what are you going to do this weekend? And they're like, I think we should go skiing. It's like the really cool thing to be doing right now. Like all the other girls at school are going skiing. Like I wanna go too, it's super cool and trendy. And I was like, guys, do you understand what's happening right now? The fact that we're revolutionizing the definition of this sport and who this sport is meant for mm -hmm. and who is like cool within the sport and that entire culture behind it, that is so deeply impactful. And so to have even had the tiniest bit of impact in that and to have even you know, influenced one young girl to make her life just the tiniest bit better, I felt like I already would have met my goal. And just seeing the explosion that it's had worldwide is, is so heartwarming. It's incredible. Now, Sheila, um, you know, the irony is that in the US, girls of color have not benefited from Title IX as much as girls, <clears throat> as, as, as girls who are white. And, and that's because of income, right? I mean, it is, uh, you know, kids from families who have access to private club teams and get the training, get the, you know, get the roster spots in high school uh, and so forth. It's, it's, there is this gap that's in place. Right yeah. now, and I know that matters to you. Can it you talk does about matter that a little bit? To me. Um, 
it's really been interesting because ever since I bought into the teams, uh, my teams actually go into the communities and they try to, you know, they, we invite the girls in to watch them practice and so forth and so on. But the phenomenon that's happening now is they've taken sports out of the school system here in the United States. And so what that has happened, uh, it's really created a gap of the haves and the have-nots. And with people of color, they can't afford these private clubs where they can get trained and, have, and then hire trainers. And so we're seeing a real lag of, you know, people of color that are able to really have access to all the sports. And it's not just basketball, we have these AAU teams, but um, for skiing, any of that, they do not have these opportunities. So that's why you don't see them out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's less than 1% that actually get to go. So that's why we excel in basketball, mm -hmm. you know, and our, our women's USA team is always winning the gold medal. Mm -hmm. The men don't, so. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it, it's really, for me, distressing to see that gap. And what I'm really seeing, and you see it in the suburbs and the soccer moms and everything, you don't see people of color out there mm -hmm. because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And they don't have that liquid income, you know. Yeah. And we've seen PE. We've seen the loss of PE over P the past PE years. doesn't even exist in school systems anymore. Yeah. So that's why. Um, the only places out on the basketball court or on track. Mm -hmm. You do see them in track, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, you know, that's a real problem. Yeah, is that one of the, one of the answers? I mean, one of the, should we bring back PE P in schools? Absolutely, there's yeah. no question about it. And it's affecting them just not being able to play, but it's affecting our health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. The fitness has gone right down the tubes. Mm -hmm. And they should be moving every day. There's been so much emphasis on the STEM. Mm -hmm. You know, keeping them in the classrooms right. and everything, right. but they're not really concentrating on a healthy mind mm. and a healthy body, mm -hmm. and that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I can just build yeah. off of that, Ooh. I think you are so, so spot on with that, and especially now, I think in terms of physical health, absolutely. Also, right. we talk so much about mental health. What is one of the biggest ways to help combat mental health is to get kids outside. Right. To get kids active and also through sports to build those communities that we have through sports. Mm -hmm. I was the only girl on my team and I became best friends with all those guys through skiing and they're still some of my closest friends today. Right. And so having those communities through sports is so mm -hmm. important and having that sense of balance. There's also I think this huge misconception that if people are participating in sports, they're giving up something else. Right. That you could be going to school, you could be doing something more productive. But what people don't understand is that when you're exercising, you're scientifically proven to be more productive in the classroom. And when you are healthier physically, you are able to learn more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And you are able to manage your time better. And you learn leadership skills. You learn confidence and resilience. Mm -hmm. And all of these aspects that maybe you can't learn in a math classroom. Maybe you can. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I love math. I'm mm -hmm. a huge nerd. But I think that you know, being able to find that, that balance is so critical and yeah. so often overlooked. So I think Sheila is so spot on with that. Well, problem solving skills too. One of my favorite moments from the Olympics was when you were at the top of one of those hills and uh, unlike the other girls, the women who would get up there and they would just sort of gather themselves, you did this thing where you're like in your head, you're, you're, you can see you're, you're solving the problem in your head. You're visualizing step by step by step how you're gonna solve this incredibly challenging and ri even risky problem. Um, and so, I don't know, t t tell me about the moment a little bit. Uh, what was, what were you doing there exactly? And then make that translation. How can that type of um, exercise benefit kids who are trying to solve other problems in their lives? Absolutely. So I grew up doing a bunch of different sports. I grew up running cross country and track. I played basketball. Um, I played soccer. I skied. I had a brief stint in equestrian. You know, like we were doing everything. And um, I think that one thing I learned is I learned so much from the other sports too. And so it's not just that I started skiing and I was, you know, laser focused. I went to full time school. I went to full time school. I skied on the weekends. Um, I did take a gap year in order to go to the Olympics. I hope that's permissible, you know. <laughs> but in terms of being a nerd, like, that's me. I'm a huge nerd. And so when it comes to the psychology of it all, I think I took so much from my background in the classroom 
mm -hmm. my background in other sports, and in terms of my capacity to learn. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of fed into what I think, in my opinion, makes me a very unique skier. Mm -hmm. I make great use of uh, visualization. Mm -hmm. I do a ton of breathing techniques. I actually do my track warm up at the top of the ski hill, partially because I'm superstitious and partially because I just like A skips and they make me feel like I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think you really learn so much from the other sports too, mm -hmm. um, and especially in terms of teamwork, especially in terms of resilience. And that has done so much for me. I still run every day. I ran six miles today back toward the, the river. But just having a wide variety and finding that balance, I cannot stress this enough. Like, mm -hmm balance, stay in school, participate in sports, have equitable access, like being able to balance everything together, that's the key to success. Even if everybody were able to do sports, if that's the only thing they're doing, I don't think I would advocate for that. Yeah. I want to advocate for everyone to have healthy, well-rounded lives, and sports are a huge part of that. Yep, yep. So you've been an inspiration, obviously, to girls in China, but to here as well, when you, and you grew up in San Francisco. When you, <clears throat> and we study this within Project Play. We gather the data, we break it down, why kids of different demographic groups are not playing, what are the reasons, et cetera. One of the big reasons um, with Asian American girls and, and is, is the homework and like, is this gonna get in the way of, of I think you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, uh, you know, just uh, advancing to college or whatever. How do you look at the barriers, uh, psychological, cultural, or otherwise, that keep Asian American girls from playing sports and what can we do to address those? Well, I think you, I, yes, Asian Americans, but also in general, because it is incredibly rare for kids to be going to school full time and then also be a professional athlete. Like when I say that to people, half the time they're like, are you joking? Like, what, is this some kind of elaborate joke? Like, no, I genuinely went to school full time. I found time to go skiing. I actually think I became a better skier because of it, because I didn't run the risk of burning out. I didn't run the risk of getting bored. Every time I went skiing, I was treasuring that time, and it was my time to have fun, and it was something I was looking forward to all week. Mm -hmm. And that love for the sport is ultimately what I think really fueled a lot of my success in skiing. That said, I think there is this also huge conception of this sport is not for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you can do that. You know, I see the boys on TV, they can go do that, good for them, but the, for so many people, the thought hasn't even crossed their mind, like, I could do that too. Mm -hmm. And so now, if the first time you're hearing about free skiing is from you know, a young girl who looks like you, or um, is from your culture, speaks your language, that really does something about your perception of the sport and what you think is capable for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that is really something that I've been focusing on, um, on the representation aspect, which I think is so, so, so important, where you see someone and you think, that could be me, what can I do now? Where can I find a community that I feel like supports me? We can grow together. Right, right. And Sheila, do you think there are legal interventions that could be added as well? You know, we, at the recent Project Place Summit, which we were happy to host mm -hmm. you at, we had a panel featuring um, some a, a, a kid from New York City, a, a former high school student, um, <clears throat> who wanted to play volleyball. And um, he, there was no volleyball team at his school. And so he start, talked to his athletic director, um, and he noticed that there were a lot of volleyball programs in schools that had more resources. He thought that was unfair. He gathered the data, he and, an, an, and a, a, a female athlete gathered the data, uh, put together a lawsuit against the uh, in New York City schools, arguing that there's a racial discrimination factor in place here, that there are disparities, that kids from schools with resources, which are predominantly white schools, had far more teams than kids, uh, schools that predominantly serve um, black and brown populations. And they actually won this thing, it got settled. Right. And the right. city of New York agreed to create 200 teams by 2024 and to rethink uh, what to do with these small schools that can't, just a little harder for them to create teams. They bundle them and you can compete, you know, three schools can compete for one team kind of, anyway, I was like, wow, maybe, you know, Title IX has been a gender lens, but, in terms of addressing the racial gap, um, how do you assess um, something like that in New York, an intervention like that? I mean, should we be thinking about applying a racial disparity lens to address some of these gaps? Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is on balance. There's no question about it. And I'll tell you a story. I mean, just as an owner 
especially, and I'm going to focus on the WNBA. Um, when I bought the team, did you realize that they had no locker room? Mm -hmm. I had to take my own money and build a locker room out of a storage unit. We had no offices. I remember being up in the owner's box and they said, you know, the team is yours. And they said, you have absolutely no equipment. Mm -hmm. So I had to start from scratch. And the Mystics were really one of the first teams to ever get started. Mm -hmm. So I mean, why do we have to do that? Now, you told that story and I think that's a great story. I'm working through the lens of an owner mm -hmm. who owns teams. And I, I do see so many disparities there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been an uphill battle yeah. mm -hmm. for me to really even get my team to be legitimate. Right. Mm -hmm. and, you know? and yeah, Title IX doesn't only, I mean, Title IX only applies to schools. So the business environment, the it, business it's a different is kind even of worse legal. Because even in the ownership group, when you look at the uh, employees that are helping you run the team, mm -hmm. they're all white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly fighting for diversity mm -hmm. to get in there. Now we've got maybe 20% of our employees are people of color. But you know, in a leadership role, I have to be a leader to make sure that we get people that look like the, them, the players. They, they want to be, they want to be able to talk to someone that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's constant. Yeah. And it's something that I'm constantly working on. Yeah. But even there, there's even, I will tell you, we've been, and maybe I shouldn't talk about this too much, but anyway, there are even salary dis disparities. Mm -hmm. Black employees and white employees. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I'm constantly watching and fighting for. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. yeah. So, I mean, and what people don't realize, and this is really important, even though you've been very successful and you've, you've had all of the success in the world. We have got to remember, because of the Ro Roe v. Wade, mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will tell you, Title IX can go away just like that. Mm -hmm. It really can. Mm. Because we're still consistently working and fighting an uphill battle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. across the board and trying to keep sports for women yeah. mm -hmm. out there. I mean, I was on collective bargaining, uh, trying to get our player salaries up. It's a business. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem with the WNBA is we never had a really good business model. And it's something that we're constantly working on. Mm -hmm. We raised a $75 million fund last year, which we have spread over our 12, our 12 teams to see if we can even improve the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason why I bought into three teams because I was asked to buy the Washington Mystics and I said, you know, why me? And they said, why not you? So I was the first woman to really get into sports ownership. And so, um, but I looked at the financials as a businesswoman. As I said, you know, I don't know whether this is going to work or not. <laughs> so I called Ted Leonsis, who um, at the time owned the Capitals, and he had first right of refusal of the Washington Wizards. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I remember I came out of A. Poland's office and he says, you know, this is highly confidential, do not tell anyone. He gave me the financials, I'm sitting in the car, I called my attorney and I said, look, I'm coming down your office in 15 minutes, I've been offered a sports team. And my attorney says, Sheila, don't buy a sports team. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, if you were offered the sports team, what would you do? And he was silent. I said, you just answered my question. Mm. I said, I will be there. I said, I'm about five minutes away. And I said, I want you to get Ted Leonsis on the phone. Got him on the phone and I said, Ted, um, A. Poland just offered me to buy the Washington Mystics. I said, but I want to make you an offer and uh, one that I hope you won't refuse. I said, you can have the first woman and the first African American in the ownership. I want to buy into the Wizards and I want to buy into the Capitals team. I have the financial wherewithal to do it, mm -hmm. not a penny more, a penny less. Mm -hmm. And he says, okay, I'll take it back to the rest of the you know, ownership. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, a week later, he says, you've been approved. So then I went through all the rigmarole. But to make a very long story short, what I did, I was able to open the door 
for so many other owners, mm -hmm. women owners. I mean, we got now owners of the Seattle Storm, right. um, the Atlanta Dream, you know, so, and there's coaches. Now, the other thing that I want to emphasize, and this is really important, when Title, Mi Title IX passed, we had about 80% women's coaches that were coaching the, in the, through the NCAA. As the years have gone by, it's now down to 50% because now we have more men coaching women's teams, mm -hmm. and now it's even lower. Mm -hmm. We're in the 30 to 40% range, and we've got to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. You know. Why do you think it's happening? I don't know. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're studying this, but we just know that we're not able to put more women onto the bench as coaches. Yeah. Mm. Now, you know, why that's happening, and this is what we have to start realizing. Something is going on that we just don't know quite what's happening. Why aren't women still in a leadership role in, as coaches? And what is going on? And we're really not in the decision-making role as owners of teams. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, I can tell you the problem starts at the base. I mean, again, we collect the data on this. We know that three at the, at the youth level, three out of every four coaches are men. And that number hasn't moved right. uh, over the past decade or so, despite all of these young women who have grown up under Title IX and became athletes and so forth. There's something, for, they're, they're, at the base, we have a, a minimum number of women coming into the system. Right. And then they get, weeded out, I, I, you know, for whatever reason, doesn't move along. But it's something that we need to keep our eye on because as young girls are going into the system of sports and competing, yeah. we need to be there to help make those decisions for them. Mm -hmm. We need to be their coaches. Mm -hmm. So these are things we have to keep an eye on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you mentioned Roe early in your comments. So yeah. I want to dive deep on Lilith. Obviously, that's significantly in the news. There is real concern that the lifting of Roe will hurt women's sports because if women have unwanted, have to have unwanted pregnancies, then they're gonna have to quit their, uh, you know, high school teams or college teams or their, their pro or their Olympic careers will be interrupted or there'll be a, an inability to plan for all this stuff. Um, how do you, let me ask you first, Eileen, as, you, as an athlete in the system right now, how do you assess the impact of uh, the Supreme Court's decision on women's sports? Oof, man. I mean, mm -hmm. look, I'm an athlete and I'm a model, so my body is my job, mm -hmm. right? And so seeing that kind of regulation towards my body, which is quite literally, you know, my biggest focus all the time is it's devastating. And you know, 9% of abortions are teenagers. And so if you think about all those girls who are, could have been in high school sports, who could have been training for the next Olympics, who could have been me, you know? Like, it's terrifying to think about. And um, I, I, you know, as a young person, it's uh, very alarming and it, yeah, it's, it's scary. I wanna see what Sheila on the administrative side has to say about that as mm -hmm. well, but it's, um, just from a you know personal standpoint, it's very scary. Yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, we can get in the weeds of this. I just do not feel as though government should be involved mm -hmm. in our decision. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, the thing that's even scarier, if you've been reading the papers, and I just feel as though President Biden needs to get away from this, he's trying to pass another law on um, transgender and giving everybody equal time. I think right now is not the time for him to make that move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just think they're moving too fast without thinking about the implications down the road mm -hmm. because then you're gonna have the right that's gonna be able to step on that and take it all the way up. Yeah. You're talking about uh, <clears throat> transgender uh, athletes playing in the sport they uh, and, yeah, and, you he, know, they identify. Yeah, he wants to pass another law, and I just think he needs to just halt it right now. Right. Because we've got bigger fish to fry, right? For political reasons. Well, let me ask you about the, the impact of Roe on, on, like, professional sports. I mean, so now you have athletes under contract that you're counting on. I mean, how, how do you assess this? I mean, do you, you look, this, look at this as a potentially a disruptive thing? My girls 
or mothers. I have a lot of mothers already on the team, and it, it's a little bit disruptive when they come to me and they say, I'm pregnant, you know. Um, I'm like, oh dear. Um, but, you know, I congratulate them, and they, they play maybe into their fourth, fifth month. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's up to them. Mm -hmm. And then they take maternity leave, but it's something that we have agreed to through the collective bargaining. I cannot stop them. They want to be mothers. Yeah. And then they, this, I can't really comment on that. I will get fined. Mm -hmm. but I'm just saying, I'm very proud of them, and they, they've handled it well. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what is the next stage of, of growth with Title IX? I mean, what would you like, what would both of you like to see happen over the next 50 years with, uh, with girls and women's sports? Well, first of all, I think PE's got to get back into the school system. It really does. Mm -hmm. And um, we got to start leveling the playing field for those that haves and the have-nots. Mm -hmm. This economic disparity that is going on that is really cutting really talented players mm -hmm. off with the kneecaps. And that, it's just not fair. Mm -hmm. Because when you do see people of color that are competing on the Olympic level, they are really good, mm -hmm. and they win. Mm -hmm. And I just think this is another way of marginalizing races that cannot compete in all these sports, and I think it just needs to stop. We need to make the playing field equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I am not kidding, mm -hmm. because once they are involved with swimming, skiing, you name it, they can do it. Mm -hmm. They just have to have, be given the opportunity. opportunity. Yeah. And that's the important thing. Yeah. What about you, I Totally Eileen? agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, I think tying back into kind of the, the cultural aspect of that, I think in terms of representation and in terms of the financial side as well, when we talk about women not being, female athletes not being paid as highly as the men, mm -hmm. a lot of the time the biggest argument is that women's sports aren't as watched, right? And I think what's really interesting about that is some women's sports actually are more watched. I mean, if you look at gymnastics, for example, why is that? because people have individual stories mm -hmm. and because there are people like Simone Biles who are out in front paving the way and but people who- Let me stop you just a minute. All of these athletes have their individual stories and that's something that we really push. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem is we're not getting enough bodies in the seats to pay. It's a business. Mm -hmm. We aren't, even in the WNBA, we're not getting the media coverage that we should be getting. Agreed. We are not getting, making the money. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. When I have to run a team and I'm looking at ticket sales every week, I have got to make sure that we're not only being able to pay the bills, and if we're not going to pay the bills, that, this is the reason why we're not getting the salaries. You, you cannot pay people if the money's not coming in. And that's the bottom line. We are constantly fighting with ESPN, the regular networks, to be able to make sure that we get media coverage, because the media coverage is what pays the bills. This is how these colleges get all this big money. And you're going to see it on the NCAA side, because the reason why men's sports are publicized so much is because the money's coming in there. You rarely see the women's teams on TV as much. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem. And you look in the stands, there's just not enough people. There's not enough bodies up there. Mm -hmm. This is a business that we have to run. Mm -hmm. Now, with women's soccer, they really fought for that and fought, fought for that. Now, they are, because I even go to the women's uh, soccer games in DC, they do fill the stands. It's a, it's a sport that everybody can play, mm -hmm. and everybody's out there, and they are selling tickets. Mm -hmm. But until we can crack this nut on the, these team sports for the women, it starts in the NCAA and then gets to the pros, we just aren't filling the seats, and we gotta figure out why. I agree with that. I mean, you're so right. Only 4%, I think, of televised sports are actually yeah. women's. And I think that's so interesting because I think there is a capacity for more of that, but I think there needs to be an investment first into televising it before the money can come in. I, th I know it doesn't make sense initially, <coughs> but look at things like, for example, Formula One. I got into Formula One this year. Why? Because of this Netflix show called Drive to Survive. And it's addictive because you get into the stories. I mean, I don't know 
anything about the cars and how they work. Like I had no background whatsoever, but I got into it and I cared about it because I saw the representation and I saw the media coverage first. And I know some people just are like, well, you have to be, people have to be interested before you have media coverage, but I wanna make the sometimes controversial argument that people can learn what they like. And people are intrinsically open-minded and they want to see new things and they want to hear new stories. Okay, so let me interrupt you there. Okay. <laughs> the reason why Formula One gets on TV, they got sponsorship up the wazoo. We have no sponsorship. Mm. And that's what gets media. Mm. All, everything that you see on TV, and again, it's male-oriented, yeah. the dollars are coming in there. They get hundreds of millions of dollars of sponsorship. It can be from the banks, it can be from Goldman Sachs, it's from Ferrari dealers, whatever, but they pay the money. Mm. Do you know what I have to go through to try to get a sponsorship to keep my team paid on the floor? It is unbelievably hard. Mm -hmm. I cannot sell it. Mm. I cannot sell it. Yeah. And it could be the elephant in the room because of the gender yeah. issues. And I'm telling you, I have to deal with this all the time. Right. But it is the business model. It is so much easier for sponsors to put their, mo their money behind something that is sexy. And they know the people are going to watch. Formula One gets hundreds of millions of dollars behind but, but it, and that's Eileen, what gets Eileen, on TV. Eileen makes a really interesting point here. The Netflix series is a series of stories. Right. It's stories about people and teams. They're narratives, beginning, middle, and end. And what's interesting in the, the Olympics, NBC Sports has taken the same perspective. And they get huge viewership from women. And they focused on the storytelling as opposed to the results itself. Right. And, you know, the nitty gritty stuff. They help you fall in love with, you know, the athlete, or they know the little bit of the backstory. It might be just a little two-minute profile, but you, you get a sense of who they are. So my question is this. Do we need to sell women's sports differently than we sell men's sports? It's something that we're working on, and I've worked with Adam Silver. I said, you know, we're only on in commercials during our season. I have been trying to get them to not only do the NBA, but the WNBA at the same time, whether we're playing or not. Now, this is something else I want to bring up. Our girls cannot make money in the US. They go to Europe. What? We're working on it. Brittany Grant. Um, but our girls have to go to Europe to make money, and they can make a million to two million, which is still not enough compared to men that are sitting on the bench that aren't even on the hardwood half the time. They make 1.8 million just sitting there. Okay, and then you get your, you know, your super celebrity players out there, and they're, they're really raking it in. But my top players only get a couple, I mean, we're maybe close to 200,000 for the whole season whereas the men are making millions, tens of millions of dollars. So for our players to be able to survive, they have to go to Europe. FIFA now has more control over us than we can. We can't even get our players back into training camp because they're finishing up over in Europe. And that impacts our season. It impacts our just winning or losing, and, you know, and I'll sit here and I'll listen to my coach and he says, we've got two more players that are coming in from Europe, maybe in two weeks. Mm -hmm. That isn't fair to us. Yeah. Mm. Those are all and this is bears. just something yeah. we cannot figure out because the players say, well, we'll stay in Europe and play. You cannot force us to make training camp or else we can't play the rest of the season. We don't pay them enough yeah. and we can't. I can't get advertising, I can't get sponsors. Um, we finally got our own facility that was built by the city. And they told me it was going to be an 8,000 seat facility. It's now been dragged down to 4,200. Mm. I can't make money on a 4,200 facility. Yeah. Mm. You know? And these are the realities of going into the pros, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eileen, you're, I mean, you're in an individual sport. I, I want to get your thought on this idea of how to sell women's sports because you have your story. People are just now learning it, but what they know about your story, they love. You have, I don't know, two dozen sponsors, global sponsors, and people have responded to who Eileen Gu is. Do you have any guidance on how to sell women's sports based upon your experience? Yeah, I think 
look, I'm an optimist, right? I'm an optimist. I like to think of myself as a change maker, and I like to think of myself as someone who has years and years ahead in her career to go and make concrete change and to physically do everything that I can. And so I think listening to Sheila talk has been so incredibly insightful because there's so many hurdles to overcome and so many barriers. And I think that people like Sheila are, are so incredible in leading that charge and being that representation on all levels, not just the athletes, but also the administration and the coaches. And I think that that was really eye-opening for me. Um, in my experience, look, I think it is about the stories. And I think it is about representation. I think it is about cultural shift. If an entire culture shifts towards sports. And if people are going home and they want to watch sports and then they feel inspired to go participate in sports and the access is equal and men and women are both participating in that, I think that people, why not? Why do people not want to watch women? That's the question. I think because, first of all, they're not given that nudge because right now, men's sports are more mainstream. When if you're talking about the big men's players, it's because everybody else knows those men, male players. Mm -hmm. But what if suddenly people were talking about female players with the same enthusiasm, and there were leaders mm -hmm. who created that conversation first? Mm -hmm. And then people naturally want to draw in. I believe in the good in people, and I believe that people care. Mm -hmm. And that if someone's like, wow, did you hear about this amazing thing that this one person did, that this one girl did, mm -hmm. this one performance, did you hear about it? Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, no, 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 I didn't. What happened? And then they're talking about it, and then they build a movement, and they create that from the ground up. I think it is possible, and I want it to be possible, and I will make it possible. So there you go. I'm sure you will. That's my take. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah. Um, so what's next for you? So I will be going to Stanford in the fall, um, but first I'm going to a training camp uh, in August and September to get back on snow, which I'm really excited about. Yeah. I'm doing some fashion projects coming up, which I'm very excited about. Uh, it's another aspect that I feel I'm very passionate about, and you know, all those areas are what make me me. You know, I'm I lean the skier, and I'm I lean the person who wants to speak up for women in sports and for equity, and I I am the person who wants to talk about balance, and I also want to go nerd out about quantum physics. And so mm -hmm. I think that the hardest part for me personally right now is kind of striking that balance, right, mm -hmm. of, of charging forward and doing everything that I can and um, speaking out and donating and uh, participating in all these charity events and mobilizing young women. And then on the other hand, like, finding time to be 18. Mm -hmm. And I'm about to go to college. I, do I know what I'm majoring in? No. Am I nervous about making friends? Yes. And kind of, you know, grappling with that and being OK with being a kid and like enjoying my childhood. And I think sometimes it's really hard because I have so much pressure on my shoulders. Mm. You know, there, there are a lot of people watching me, and there's a lot of expectation. And so I, I, I don't want to let anybody down, but uh, mm. it's hard. Mm. What impact, at the end of the day, sort of a big question, but what impact do you want to have on this world? My legacy, Whew, big question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that I want my legacy to be one of changing the dialogue around women in sports, around mm -hmm. women in extreme sports, mm -hmm. um, in uniting different countries and different cultures mm -hmm. through sport and through other avenues, mm -hmm. in finding areas of dialogue and in lifting one another up, mm -hmm. in, you know, existing in a world where you're skiing down the hill and you see a girl in the park in, you know, at Aspen, falling down, and then a guy her age helping her up and being like, hey, you know, what's up, you know, I, what trick was this? And she's saying, you know, this trick, and he's like, oh, I'm working on that too, do you have any pointers to me? And working together and not having that sense of, ah, oh, you ski like a girl. Yeah. Or not having that sense of like, I'm the only girl here. I am s almost scared to try a new trick because I don't want to fall because I'm representing, you know, all of women in skiing right now. And just like having this immense pressure of feeling like all the guys are looking to me. And if they make jokes about girls not being as good, I am the like representation of the opposite. And like removing that pressure and being able to just enjoy sports for sports yeah. because I know that I have sisters around me and I know that I have brothers around me and I know that I have people in the sport who want to support me. So like creating that that dialogue and that culture going into the next generation, I think, is my biggest goal. Well, I really, for you, I really hope that you are always able to feel that joy of sport. I've seen it happen with too many athletes where so much going on, the return on investment is, and it's, you've got to just stay in that moment, those intrinsic, you know, that that's what that's what's going to power that's you. It's not going away. Yeah. I'm so in love with skiing. <laughs> it's not changing anytime soon. So. Definitely. Now, Sheila, what do you hope your legacy will be? What do you... Uh, 
What do you hope to achieve with everything you're doing in the sports world? Oh, I was going to ask you which one. <laughs> yeah. In the sport <laughs> world, I would like to see an expansion, more expansion teams coming in. I would like to um, try to solve this issue with FIFA to keep our players in our country. Yeah. Because we need them for advertising mm -hmm. and to talk about how we can get more young people in there. I mean, my players are very involved in the community, and I do see them making differences in the players' lives. Mm -hmm. um, but expansion teams are really important, and we've just got to find a stronger business model mm -hmm. to see how we can start bringing in more money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I certainly hope that over time we come to look at the uh, w women's sports uh, for as great, as uniquely great as they are. One of the challenges of Title IX is that it, it basically, well, if, if this is what the boys get, this is what the girls get. And one of the inevitable consequences of that is that women's and girls' sports have been formed in the image of boys' sports. But there is this third, there's this next dimension, I believe, and, and Lindsey Krause of the New York Times wrote about it the other day, which is, uh, it's not that women's sports are, you know, they're, you know, men are bigger, stronger, faster, and therefore better. How do we recognize that what, what girls and women are doing in sports is truly unique and special and beautiful in its own and powerful in its own kind of way? And then we can begin to attach well, value to that, which will unlock business opportunities, but, you know, removes this, mm. it's almost like it needs to kind of break off and go on its own. But. Yeah, and but people don't understand that women in basketball play the purest form of the game, mm -hmm. which you're seeing on TV with the men. You know, they're trying to one-up each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not so much a team sport, mm -hmm. but I, what I see with the women is they really do play it as a team sport. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, I'm hoping, and we're going to continue to fight for getting their pay scale up, because that's what's really important. That's been our biggest struggle, mm -hmm. is trying to, it's the business model that we're just, it, yeah. it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard as an owner. It's been a struggle, and I've had the team since 2007. But we did win the national championship in 2020. Woo! Well, with that, I think we're, we're at time here, uh, and we're gonna let you go. We've got a, another session coming in here right afterwards, so, um, if, uh, you know, know that we have to kind of clear the room here in a bit. Um, and an edited version of this conversation will be on the Ideas Festival uh, website tomorrow and on the app. Uh, it will be pushed out through the social media in our program, the Sports Society program at the Aspen Institute. Um, so take a look at that, share it, um, and comment, and let's keep this conversation going. Title IX has not gone away. To all the uh, investors, the people who have the resources and the capability, let's invest in women's sports. Let's push it forward. So we've heard Show the conversation. Show up at the game. Let's do it. Let's Show do it. This is game. where change happens. So uh, amazing. Let's do it. <laughs>